the next chapter where you're traveling around, you're starting to get to travel around hell a little bit. And then you run into a night hag. And there's basically an entire chapter that is one basically 100% social. And the mechanics for how to run that are laid out in a way that is incredibly legible. And I was like, wow, back to back. This journey to level eight is really strong. <laughs> and then we got to the next chapter and they got a little bit loosey goosey on progression. And they're like, this should be okay for a ninth level party. And I'm like, when the hell did we level up? I'm scrolling back through. Yeah. Am I supposed to use this chart up here? Is this just guidance? When, when do we level up? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, Alejandro, I'm talking about Descent to Avernus and Mad Mag. Uh, I've been reading through Avernus because one of the things we do around here, uh, you will hear us talk broadly about adventures we like, adventures we don't like. But more specifically, when we're reading adventures, we're sort of deconstructing the organization of information in them. How do they use battle mats and dungeon maps? How do they not use them when they want to do... Like we, we take apart entire chapters of the book to figure out what they're doing with them. And we get some interesting insights from that. If you're in our server, sometimes you'll see me posting small bits from adventures I'm reading from wizards. And I'll talk about specific things I like. Um, when I was reading through chapter three, let me pull it back up because I've been on my phone most of the morning because I've been battling my ISP. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, it was chapter three. Yeah, I've been in chapter three lately. Chapter two was really strong. I did not like chapter one of Avernus. Bad chapter. Does a lot of yeah. things that I think make sense, but um, I don't really, know. Really spoils the whole book. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a bummer. I'm having some issues with chapter three because it's sprawling a little bit. Like it has normal sandbox chapter issues where it sprawls a little bit and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to be dealing with? Yeah, I think there are sections of this that are incredibly potent and really good. Like, there's some really good information stuff. Like, there's a... I posted it yesterday. Like, they, they talk about the locations of a map, because there's like 16 rooms in this dungeon. And in the About This Area section, they listed which rooms were connected to which maps and which levels in a very efficient sentence. And I was like, oh, shit, we need to steal that. <laughs> Yeah, these map, these little guidance maps, things they give are not always useful. <laughs> uh, Jody's asking, I missed last week's class and haven't been able to watch recording yet. Will I be lost for today's session? Uh, maybe not lost. We're going to be talking about the how do you use GM Binder and really more about the formal presentation of the things we went over from last week. So if you've been, if you've read D&D uh, &D adventures before, you'll probably be able to pick up on what we're talking about, but we're going to be focusing on GM binder as a tool. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, yes. Yeah, slides are available. CT. I will get you a link. I don't think these slides have been posted yet, but the slides where the previous weeks have been. Yeah, these slides, this is mostly a, a walkthrough of um, GM Binder. So we didn't really write a whole lot of slides for it. And it's we try to keep it pretty short and mostly do question and answers this session. The last time we did this, it took us an hour to get through GM Binder. Maybe we'll be faster this time. <laughs> True that. Dave, 
Let's see. How's everybody doing today? I'm glad you all have stuck with us. This has been a really cool experience for us getting to interact with so many people. We were not really sure how folks were going to respond to us, and we offered to do this in the first place, but it has been really overwhelming for us. One, how many of you signed up, and two, how consistently positive all of you all have been throughout this whole process. This has really been a banner month for us interacting with all of you. Yeah. It's been a banner month for me interacting with you, Sarge. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> even though I called you Beaker the other day and you got mad. Oh. <laughs> it's so annoying because like you have these like really like thick glasses, which fits the what's the scientist Muppet today? I can't remember Munson. his name right now. Like you, like you kind of look like Bunsen sometimes when yeah. you cut your hair and your hats off. Yeah, and there's like me running around trying to be helpful the whole time. Oh. I was so <laughs> mad because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that goose gift is too <laughs> funny. Like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Man, I want to go watch some old Muppet stuff now. <laughs> Yeah, old Muppet stuff is funny. Um, the Muppet movie that came out with Jason Segal is pretty fun. I, I really it. need to take a I need to take a weekend and watch it. Did you watch it with Jack? What did he think of it? Yeah, I watched it with Jack. Uh, no, he liked it. Um, so he didn't know what the Muppets were. Like that's how it started. This was like this is within the age of pandemic. Pandemic. So I was like something something Kermit. And he's like, who's Kermit? And I'm like. <gasps> Oh my god! <laughs> I have failed as a father. I know, for real. Like he could tell you as exactly. An old millennial late yeah. Gen Xer, I have failed. Yeah, it's, well, I haven't totally failed because yesterday I said Weird Al, and he goes, "Do you mean Weird Al Yankovic?" I'm like, "Oh, yes, I do mean Weird Al Yankovic." <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, was like, that when he walked in on our impromptu meeting? <laughs> I, no, no. This was yesterday while he was um he was out. Like the weather's getting nice here, you know. Yeah. For like the the two three weeks of the year, it's actually possible to go outside mm -hmm. without hating life. You know, you're in Louisiana, um, and I don't know if you guys have the cold that we do though. Oh my god, you, like no, it, it got it, every time it gets cold here, we panic. It's so gross here, and you would think like Oklahoma it must be nice in the winter. No, it's like ice and hell. Like it's like being in in what's the layer of hell? Levisticus. There's uh, Levisticus, and then like I'm Levistus. reading Avernus. Like, isn't like Mephistopheles on an ice layer too? Maybe. Um, I don't know. They change it from edition to edition. Levisticus is definitely cold flavored because he pops up in Ryan. Yeah, he's frozen. Yeah, he's like Stygia. Dying, so Stygia. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he's like in a block of frozen ice. And he's like, ah, this sucks. Like, uh, in one edition, he looked like <laughs> he looked like uh, Bob Marley. Like, someone took Bob Marley and like tossed him into a block of ice. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. Uh, Cheyenne asked about finding the replays of these videos. Cheyenne, you can follow the links that you use to sign up to watch the replays. Additionally, we do upload them to YouTube. You can find them on our YouTube page. Uh, we're on YouTube as Dungeon Master Dave, and we have links on the resource sheet to them as well. Yeah, According to Eric, the eighth layer is now called Cania. I believe Eric is telling us that's where Mephistopheles is. Yeah. There's a picture of uh, Levistus as Bob Marley. I just put it in that legendary lounge. <laughs> He's like, no you woman, wondering, if you no guys, cry. If you guys are wondering, if you guys are wondering what our jobs are like when we're not solving logistical issues and trying to get stuff done, it's just this. <laughs> no woman. Yep. Aren't we talking about Bob Marley in this class last week too? We were talking about uh, people calling me Benjamin. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's and it led us back to the Lean Audi song. Yeah. We be jamming. We be jamming. We be jamming. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, man. Lean on me. All right. It's 110. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right. Uh, <laughs> hang on. Let me get the music, music on so my headphones don't 
fail. I, I remembered to plug them in last night, so. <laughs> All right, well, then you, like, then your headset died, like, the middle of the, uh, the Saturday game last week. Like, we were running, and then you're like, whoop, I'll be back. No, it was, it was when I was at a meeting with you, and I think. Oh, yeah, you jumped Jenner in and Jen's meeting, and then we didn't realize you were there. <laughs> and then yeah, or no, you, yeah, and, you and Laura were talking, that's it. Hey, guys, oh, okay. uh, welcome to the fourth, the penultimate, my favorite word. My wife hates when I use that word, penultimate. Um, like, because I'll be watching, like, we'll be watching WandaVision. I'm like, you know which episode this is? This is the penultimate episode. She hates that. Um, you should use anti-penultimate next time. Yeah, Prepare I do. I do. I use that one, too. <laughs> I use that one, too. Like, especially if I get it wrong, I'm like, I thought this was the penultimate episode. But it's actually the anti-penultimate episode. <laughs> and then, okay, anyways. Um, in this one, we're going to be discussing mostly GM Binder. And hopefully it doesn't take too long. And we'll probably hold questions. Well, we'll see. Um, I thought it wouldn't take that long last week or Monday. And it did take long. So there you go. Um, but let me show you in that first slide here. Uh, here's what you're going to learn in this session. Uh, we cover the basic usage of GM Binder to format your adventures. So what's GM Binder? Basically, GM Binder is a, um, like a content management system um, or software similar to like InDesign or um, Home Brewery. Uh, GM Binder is the one I use the most because <clears throat> it's pretty easy to use. And I haven't gotten off my butt and learned how to use InDesign. <laughs> but I would say it's pretty easy to use even for folks who, um, you know, are just getting started. Um, InDesign is a Adobe product and Adobe products basically need like a doctorate <laughs> to master. Um, I mean, I'm joking, but not like um, if any of you see my Photoshop work that comes from like 20 years of experience and then trying to switch over to like a new Adobe program, you think, oh, well, my skills will transfer over pretty easy. No, they don't. <laughs> so anyways, um, I'll eventually learn InDesign, but I recommend for everybody GM Binder starting off because it uses Markdown text and Markdown is a plain text formatting syntax aimed at making writing <clears throat> for the internet easier. In fact, uh, a lot of programs like the Scored uh, and, um, oh, what's that? Uh, oh man, I can't think of the name of it now. I used to use it for my other job, but a lot of like, uh, communication software will end up using it Talking about wordpress no no the um what's the one that roll 20 works with their chat software not discord but uh starts with an s anyways i can't Bas remember either yeah <laughs> not important uh so we're going to cover the basics of markdown in this class however we're not going to go into great detail in any other languages that work with gm binders such as html and ss css Sorry about that. Sneezes. It's that time of year. Um, we will only show you the features relevant to producing content and publishing it using GM Binder. But keep in mind that GM Binder is, um, has a lot of doodads on it. So feel free to explore the bevy of options it provides content creators. All right. So here's why we use GM Binder. It's easy to use. So it's much more easy to use than like InDesign. Or um, you know something a little bit more complicated. Um, there's another one called Affinity that's out on the market that's supposed to be pretty easy too. Uh, Gene Binder comes with a free version, which is nice. Um, granted, the bells and whistles version is highly recommended, especially if you want to do this professionally, because it'll have like auto save <clears throat> and a number of other number of other features that'll make your life easier. Uh, GM Binder also has its own community on Discord. So if you've got questions about it or if there's something that's not working, they can help you out. And the um, the the guy who runs it, Levi, is a pretty cool guy, uh, which turns into great support, too. Yeah, really helpful for <clears throat> if you have any problems, they can help out. And then finally, it's got fantastic UX and UI, which are just fancy ways of saying like user experience and uh, user design. So it, you don't have to like, finesse with it too much i think that's the big problem i had with home brewery granted i haven't used home brewery in a year so i don't know any advancements they've made but um gm binder at least um is pretty straightforward in its design all right so i'm going to switch to my video form here and i'm going to share my screen 
And all right, so this is GM minus is what it looks like. I'm already logged in, but you would have to go in and basically create an account in order to to do it. Uh, like I said, it's free to sign up. Um, you can see the front page. It lets you a lot of the creators, they will share their own stuff on here. So if you wanted to create stuff and share it to a broader audience and get feedback and stuff like that, you could do that. Uh, I, I personally don't. I use, you know, because I have everything kind of gated on my Patreon and stuff. But this would might be a nice way for you to like get started and have people notice your content. You'll see too that I've got my library here. And this has, sorry guys, the allergies are killing me. This has like everything that I've pretty much ever written. And what's crazy is I think it's all one page. <laughs> so um, I could, I guess we could organize a little bit better, huh? But uh, yeah, if I wanted, I could create some new folders and stuff. But this is basically everything that I've got. Um, I can organize all my documents. And then if I had different folders, they would all be up here. Um, and pretty much you had just have two major buttons here, create new document and create new folder. And then if I had anything archived, I could view my archive. You also have similar buttons up here. GM Binder Plus is the version that I'm operating on, which gives me a few more bells and whistles. <clears throat> Notably, the auto save feature. I think I have a lifetime subscription to it, so I'm not sure what the monthly cost would be for that. Um, I believe I had a Kickstarter uh, around this time last year, which I ended up buying into. So I've got a lifetime membership. And then another create button, which basically does just the same as to create a new document. So if you wanted to start a new document on GM Miner, you just click create new document. And all you got to do is name it. And we'll just say um, roll 20 test document. Go ahead and create that. All right. So right away, this is going to load up and it's going to show you <coughs> document settings. You're going to have the name again. Whoops. You're going to have the name again any tags that you'd want to put in. So if you wanted to make it searchable within the community, tags would help you do that. I believe it'll probably also save it to the PDF itself. So if you needed to search through your own file browser on your on your PC or Mac, you could do that. Description, again, is going to be mostly for community purposes. And then if you wanted to give it like an image to represent it, like a thumbnail, you could do that. You could change the language to whatever you need it to, uh, <clears throat> mostly for search purposes. And then you've got four buttons here. You can add to the GMB search. So that's what that was out on the front page. That was at people in the GMB search. So you want it to be public. You could share the source, which will show people um, all the source information that's on the side. So if you didn't want people to see your source, you could turn that off. You could turn off the credit for a GM binder if you wanted to. So if you didn't want to have their credit on it, and I think they put it like at the bottom of the page when you share the link. And also the file names will save automatically with an underscore GM binder on it. Um, <clears throat> you could turn that off and then use default GM binder theme. So the default GM binder theme is going to look like this. It's got kind of like a pink, like a tan pinkish hue, purple letters, and then this guy right here. Uh, the GM binder theme is is fine if that's what you want to work with. I don't normally use it because I can't change the CSS on it. So um, I usually will switch that off to start. And then all you do is click save. <clears throat> You'll see right away that this page immediately went back to the default um, fifth edition color scheme, especially the one that you get in the player's handbook. So you'll see your H1 tag here, like we discussed last week is um, done with um, you know the dark red and then the body is in black the background is tan and then it has these page break or these footer markers like with the green so exactly like the php all right this on the left side here this is all the source code that's written in markdown and you could see there might be a few things if you're not familiar with um code language there might be a few things that aren't familiar to you like um like all this right here that's an image you know you're going to see some markdown text like column break um there's another image this is a div for a footnote all this stuff is pretty easy to learn and you don't even need to learn it because the, the program will do it for you. <laughs> if you need some cheat sheets, you've got this on the side here, which will tell you everything that you need to know about um, getting started with GM Binder. And then this link right here is extremely useful 
if we open this up in a new tab, this is a markdown cheat sheet for you. So if you if you're not sure what's what in markdown, this tells you every single little piece of markdown. So here's all of our headers. So if you remember in our last class, we talked about the different headers you want. So all you got to do for headers is H1 gets two hashes before H2 gets uh, H1 gets one hash, H2 gets two, and so on. Alternatively, you can also do this with an underline style. You've got emphasis, which is usually done with asterisks. So italics, you put one asterisk before the word, or you can also do underscores. Uh, strong emphasis would be two asterisks or two underscores. If you wanted to do bold and italic, you could do um, a, a three. I don't know why they didn't put it there, though. Um, but yeah, it's usually three to do it with um, uh, 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 um, three asterisks. And then strike through would use uh, the tilde, which is the little fancy button just below your escape key. And that's pretty much it. That's the main ones you'll use. And then if you wanted links and this, you can see this is a super useful document. So make sure the first time you get in, if you're not familiar with it, just click this link right here. We'll put the link in the, um, because this is from GitHub, we'll put the link in our uh, our helpful document too. <clears throat> so usually once I've got this going, I'm going to control A or command A to select everything here and just get rid of it. And then I would start by going in and putting my own document. So, so I would open up. Um, let's see. I guess I can put in vaulted there. See exactly what my stuff looks like before. Don't it... put in vault of terror. You're supposed to reveal that next week. Oh, well, what do I got that's ready to go? How about winds of Apple? Okay, not winds of Apple. Uh, Vasco Valley. Vasco Valley. Yeah, just grab one of the Vasco Valley quests. All right. So here's a part of <laughs> Sarge. No, Christ. shop, baby, shop. <laughs> I'm sitting here, like, answering some questions and reading an email real quick. He's like, I'm going to show them the thing we're not revealing until for two weeks. No! <laughs> Fine. I was going to give you all a treat, but Sarge slapped the cookie out of my hand. Sorry, guys. Anyways, this is my Google document for, it looks like, Chapter 2 of Vasco Valley, which just came out. So you've, if you have are a patron, you've probably already seen what the finished version looks like. But this is what it looks like without any fancy dress on it. You can see I've already put in all the markdown here. I've also organized it, too, for visual sake, so I could click between the different stuff in Google Documents. <clears throat> and you can see there's some weird styling things like this. Like, there's a little asterisk right here that's so it automatically knows to bold. Um, this is a placeholder for me. I'm really bad about making tables in my documents. <laughs> you can see that there's asterisks here to make this italicized. This creates a hanging indent. Actually, it creates a page break. Um, yeah, let me clarify for the chat real quick. Uh, you'll see in this document, we have simultaneously put in the required asterisks and hyphens and um, hashtag. Mm -hmm. hashtags to make sure that this formats when we copy it into GM binder. But in most cases, Dave has used the traditional document stylings for navigation and yeah. eligibility purposes. Yeah, this is, this is, this is so you're aware this, um, this doesn't let you, this, like GM binder is not going to accept your document stylings right. from Google doc or word or, Open Office or whichever word processor you're fond of, it only reads hashtags, hyphens, etc. that work within Markdown to display your content when you move it over. Yeah, you know, I bet there's a plugin, Sarge, that'll convert it all to Markdown. We should look into that. But anyways, <laughs> the reason we one have of the one, but it doesn't format the right way we want yeah. to. So Boo. Okay. Laura and I have been making sure we do it manually. Okay. So yeah, you can see this is a 32 page document with 11,500 words. Um, if I didn't make it easier for me to find with the navigation on here, it'd be a pain in the butt. So what I would normally do is I would copy all this. I doubt all this is going to copy over. Let's just grab up to here. All right. I would just copy this and I would plug it straight into there. Boop. And you can see it automatically organizes everything the way I need it to without, except it doesn't do page breaks. So I'll get to that in a second. 
but yeah, this would do everything I needed to. I'd, I'd still have to put in images and my page breaks and any placeholders that I've got, I would have to do. But this is essentially why we use Google Documents and format everything the way we do in advance, because once it hits the program, the program reads this hash mark here and automatically translates it into an H1 and so forth. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't create page breaks, which I'll show you how to do in just a minute. Okay, so let's actually, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna show you all the cool tools that they've got here. All right, so here is how to, all the stuff that you can use on GM Binder. We'll start with the beginning. All right, so this shows all of your different sections. So if you wanted to jump ahead to something, you can. Um, this is a save feature. So if you have the free version, you're gonna have to manually save. You could do that by clicking this or hitting Control or Command S. We'll also do it. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> um, this is your snippet tool, the most valuable thing that's on here. And let me show you what the snippet tool does. Basically, it gives you, it has cheat sheet or um, like plugin templates for all the different stuff you want to do. So if I wanted to create a class block, for example, boop, you can see it creates a fancy class block here. That way you don't have to manually do are the, all the markdown to do it. It automatically puts everything in and all we'd have to do is just go in and manually edit the um, fields, right? So if I wanted to write like um, Onion Man Supreme. I'm never going to be able to live this down. <laughs> if you, in the case of a class block like this, if you're wondering why it only gave you levels one, two, and then 20, uh, it does that so you can copy the lines. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Levels. So I would just go like because this. Just, it's, again, it's all just formatting. You just add in what you need, and it's going to read it. The templates that you see is just us doing it ahead of time or the, the tools providing the necessary formatting so you can fill it in. Yep. Yeah, like I said, this is all marked down. So normally to create a table like this, it would have you would have to do some like um, some pretty heinous like CSS and stuff. So it'd be a lot longer in lines. This essentially is doing the job of that and making it a lot easier by using div class and like um, which is essentially like a CS well HTML formatting that uses C applies CSS to it, which is just a fancy way of saying like it makes it look pretty. Um, but yeah, this will do all that work for you, so you don't really have to stress out about it. Uh-oh, stars here. Come here, you. She had she got her hair did and her nails done. Yeah, you're. Right. Uh, Dave, while you're uh, no, going over these things, I got a quick clarification from yeah. chat about uh, modifying the f uh, the look from wizards. Uh, yeah. They mentioned that you just showed them that, but they, they you went a little fast and some of the folks are curious how to do that again. From, what do you mean? Uh, the styling to look, oh, not make it look like Wizards of the Coast as much. Oh, okay. So yeah, under your settings here. So when it, when it starts, it's in the default GM binder format, which if we wanted to put on, you just click that button on and off in your settings, it'll automatically let you do it in the beginning. So this is what our stuff would look like if it was in this format. You've also got a number of themes. So going over your snippet editor, you've got a number of stock themes here as well. So if you wanted to look like the DMG, for example, uh, you would have to turn off GM Binders theme under settings. And then you'll see it's gonna load up, but the, now it looks like the Dungeon Master's Guides uh, style. Or I could put in, uh, this is the one I used to use all the time before I started making my own. This is the Elemental Evil, which is kind of a white with the, uh, still has the player's handbook bottoms to it. Um, they've also got some ones that are unique to the setting. So, um, oh, they got rid of Xanathar style. Huh. Interesting. Um, oh, wait, there it is. Duh. <laughs> no, I, I, Dave just didn't know how to scroll. But yeah, if you wanted like a Xanathar style that has like that kind of that fancy gold, like all you got to do is that. And it, what it does is it creates a style block here, which starts with style. And this is all just translating the 
content on the page so it looks like um, this style and then ends with the style block here. So you would leave this after you plug it in, don't mess with that. And then whatever you put in after the break would be like, you'll see automatically gets, you know, style blocks missing. All right, folks. And you just type onion man, onion man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a couple of questions about can you edit NGM binder or do you require it to paste in? No, you, uh, you can edit yep. NGM binder. Yep. We would recommend you primarily work in your word processor first because GM binder, like any sort of editing software, can crash. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly frustrating because then I get messages mm -hmm. from Dave at two in the morning. I lost an hour. And then I go yeah. back to sleep. Yeah, it, it's got a couple <laughs> bugs sometimes too where. <laughs> If you switch over to um, the print version, like it won't say anything. So I, I highly recommend before you switch away to like the print version or any other version to copy A or control A everything, copy it, and then put it into a document because nothing is worse than switching over and it lost all of your syntax and you have to start over. Or even worse, like you were just writing by hand ugh, and you'd have to start over, which is really frustrating. I mean, they know they know the problems exist. I mean, for everything else it does, you know, I'm okay with it. <laughs> but I've definitely lost two hours of work before. It's I feel like I'm it's back in the '90s again, and I'm on writing an email and somebody calls on my phone, messing up my dial-up connection. Some of you may not be old enough to remember such pain. Google Docs can crash too. Like some of our writers have talked about losing some of their yeah. stuff with Google Docs crash. Yeah. Almost any software you're working in can crash. You always want to save your work regularly, no matter yeah. what you're using. Use the most robust <laughs> drafting software you have and save often. Yeah, I mean, at least with Google, it's it's pretty rare that stuff messes up. I mean, Google's, you know, they're Google. But still, yeah, like Sard says, I mean, it's not like it was, you know, when I was writing like when I used to write back in like the uh, the nineties and man, losing, losing stuff you'd worked on was like a way of life. <laughs> but <clears throat> fortunately these days, autosave and stuff like that really um, helps get over that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah. Right, and you can, go back oh, the, the main, also another good reason that you want to edit that you don't want to edit in here. So I'll do it for monsters, but you'll notice that, like I've got Grammarly hooked in here, but Grammarly doesn't work with this. And while it does, it will underline stuff that's misspelled, at least with what I've got, it doesn't give me the option to correct stuff. It also won't correct things for um, uh, grammatical things. So if you're writing extremely long uh, pieces of content, you're gonna miss out on that. And Google will have it built in if you don't use Grammarly. I use Grammarly just because it's. I think it's a little bit smarter than Google's. Um, spell check and grammar um also they like tell you where you sit with other writers in the world <laughs> in terms of production so you know bragging rights um but uh they finally the reason we do google so if you wanted to do this professionally and work with an organization like ourselves um, almost every organization i've ever worked for that does professional content usually use google documents because it's a very easy to trade among um you know, your editors and stuff like that, more so than like OneDrive or anything else, you know, like if you want to write in Word, that's fine, but it becomes, you know, it's kind of like a, oh, you get to put it in the OneDrive and you got to download it and, you, you know, with Google Docs, it's just like you send me the link, I can immediately start commenting and, and changing it. And that's the chief reason I think this organization at least uses it. But yeah, definitely I'd, I'd start in Google on everything these days. And you'll see, like to give you an idea, I'm giving away a little cookie. So just a tiny cookie here. I'll here. turn your screen share off if you go too no, far. No, you can't. Look, <laughs> this is it's not even written yet. So Queen of Shadows, which I started drafting yesterday, like you could see I've already started to, like you could see I got like placeholders for a lot of this stuff. Um, and you could see I've put in some div class descriptives and things like that. And it's I'm already starting to lay out. So if you were in the last class, remember I told you I like to lay out all my headlines first? Well, this is what this is. And you'll see there's like a lot of just empty space because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> but yeah, this is like me working on a brand new document here. And that'll be out. I don't know when. Sometime. Um, yeah. So that's basically how we work. So um I think we told <clears throat> the Monday class this, but once we're done, we're going to be hiring writers from this pool. So 
Yeah. Um, and we're going to look for people who specifically kind of use their style so we don't have to, you know, go through the whole process of training someone again. So that's another maybe another reason that you might <laughs> want to see some of the stuff we do and how we do it. Just because we've we've been doing this for like three years now and we've we've worked out what works best within our organization to ensure like by like content once it goes from me drafting it um, through the roll 20 building process through getting into broadsword. Like this makes it way easier for everybody along that pipeline. Then everybody gets paid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll, I'll go over through some of these, but definitely if you get a copy of Gene Miner, be sure to play with it. But I'll, I'll kind of go over the basics of what each one of these are. Class blocks are like the class blocks. They, um, they're the ones that format everything nice. So you've got the, the wide one like I showed you, and you can do a narrow one too if you want. And you can see the uh, what it looks like here. Class feature is going to take, um, like if you wanted to create your own class, you could see how it kind of creates everything here. You know, it organizes your hit points and it creates those hanging indents that I talked about last week that you're not going to use often. This is one of those few times where hanging indents are, are used. Uh, column, space, column break creates a large gap. So let me show you real quick what that's going to look like. So if I go down to here, you could see there's like, even though there's a space between it here, there's none on the uh, WYSIWYG side. What you see is what you get. And no matter how many times I hit enter, it's not going to change it, right? It's because um, markdown text needs to have uh, a markdown or HTML or CSS that tells it to create a bigger space. So one way you can do that is by hitting the column spacer feature here, which you can see, boom, puts in 100 pixels of space there. Uh, the other one that doesn't that you have to be cognizant of is your column break. So it's not it's going to wrap around automatically, but you can see there's kind of an awkward break here. So if I didn't want that there, I would like chop this here and then put my column break in, make it nice and organized. Because even if I didn't have the column break, you could see it creates like a little indent there. So it's a little tedious, but you do have to put in all your column breaks. You have to tell the program where your column breaks are supposed to be, as well as your page breaks. So you can see here, right in the Griffin Writers, this needs a page break because otherwise, if I don't put a page break in, it's going to like spill all over to this like imaginary column over here, and it's going to look really goofy when you print it. So you put in a page break, pop, which creates a new page, and that's it. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to go in and do all that manually. It's not like um, Google Docs or Word or anything where it's going to automatically do it for you. Um, but, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you just go through and do it all. So, like, a document like this, I'd have to go through and add in, like, 15, you know, 15 column breaks and 15 page breaks or so. But usually I'll end up putting in, like, art and stuff like that as well, which you can pretty do pretty easily with your snippet editor. Um, you got different styles of covers here. So you can see this is the back of a D&D &D cover. Uh, now, remember, if you're if you're printing on, let's say you're doing it on just digital, you can probably get away with using this trade dress. But I wouldn't do it if you were printing like a physical copy or something. And again, this is the, the front cover. You can see it's got the red diamond underneath <clears throat> the Nodest or Modesto caps font, the red sweat swatch here and then you've got the footer the same style again that's wizards of the coast trade dress so if you're doing it like digitally or just sharing it for free it's probably fine but if you wanted to print something physical i would probably stay away from using these uh you've got if you want just a plain cover page here tan background the name of your document subtitle you got a snippet editor for that uh a description block is going to be like a te read aloud text right Creates the two things there, the little title, uh, which is an H5, like we talked about, and then the body of it. Uh, if you don't need an H5, because uh, you really don't use H5s that much in descriptive blocks, honestly, but you you can just delete that markdown. So to show you what I mean, we'll put it here. Oh, geez. Sometimes it'll kick it back to the original theme. It's, it's a bug. I'm sure they're aware of it. <laughs> but you see, uh, this created an H5 here. All you got to do is just delete it, and you can put in whatever. And then that's what your read aloud text block would look like. And then the Onion Man said, 
No spoilers, Dave. Um, let's see. Uh, external link. You put in a link that works. It's pretty easy. Just creates a syntax and you just put it in between there. Uh, you could put an image into your document, an item card, which if you wanted to make, like if you wanted to do just a card style, like uh, you wanted to do kind of like what like the Griffin Saddlebag or Loot Tavern does, you could create just item cards here, which is just an image, the name, any tags or attunement, and then the, the description of it. Uh, also reformats the document. I want to show you guys what this looks like real quick so you can, yeah. so you can see how it's created like, it's changed the formatting of everything on here. Um, so kind of cool. Um, ooh, let's get rid of all that. But yeah, what's next? Uh, monster blocks are the best. Oh, what? so they don't worry about like, if they break stuff, go back to where you inserted the descriptive block Yeah, because it, created um a spillover you just have to close it off for oh so yeah panic yeah happens. yeah you just gotta put it in div Whew, sorry <laughs> yeah good catch yeah you can see if you don't do that it's gonna be like ah but yeah you have to make sure that you always end your bracket so if you have a div that starts here for the class this it'll do it automatically for you when you put the snippet in but just so you're cognizant of it um let's see and definitely use our channel like if you're going to be in the um, adventure creation channel, which isn't going to go away anytime soon, and you're creating stuff, use that to ask questions about this stuff. Um, I'll try to get in as help as I can. I'm pretty, pretty good with GM Binder at this point, um, and I think most a lot of the people who are in there also understand it. But yeah, if you get rid of that end, so you see you've got the opening div and the closed div. That's what ends up creating this special formatting around this block, and every anything I put into it, you know, is gonna it's going to be within that block. But if I get rid of this, like the computer saying like, oh, I got to put it everything here. And then I can put the end anywhere I want, really. But yeah, that's all. That's basically everything that happened there. Um, Let's see. What else is there? Monster blocks I was talking about. So monster blocks are pretty cool. Um, You've got two styles. You've got your your one column and then you've got your two column. What's nifty is that they're all they all work on tabs. So all you got to do to type stuff would be like uh, onion man, medium, humanoid, human. And all you got to do is hit tab and it goes over to the next thing that you want to put your stuff into, you know. So really useful, at least for that first part of the stab block, because it can be really tedious, like manually entering in strength and stuff like that. You know, got to double click and hit zero and like so on and so forth. But um, yeah, the monster. One of the writers in our team made us aware of a tool. I can't remember the name. I'll see if I can find it from his messages while I'm here. It allows you to maybe build this in a generator and then get the markdown, which it reads like this. Yeah. Uh, you can use stuff like that. Uh, Dave will usually tell you before you start using tools like that, you should write it yourself because you need to know how the thing functions. Yeah. Before yeah. You're married to tools like that. Again, it's it's just like when we talked about, <clears throat> um, I think it was in the week before last, where it's like cooking, right? Like, you know, you learn the recipes before you start, you know, like if you really want to be a chef, you know, you don't, you don't just throw hot pockets in the microwave. And that's what that is. You know, it's like, yeah, sure, it's filling, but, do you, or, or, you know, you don't you need to know, kind of know what goes into the process because the monster blocks are really important for uh, understanding the inherent design of the game and how the functions of the game work towards task resolution and action economy. And really, the, the it's the engine that drives the game. So uh, when I started, I used to just make monsters every day. And my first monsters aren't great, but um, they helped me learn, like, how to balance the game and now i now i can make monsters that are like really cool and have like combination features and stuff like that because you know i understand the inherent design of the game so yeah i would say you know first learn a little bit more about monster creation uh, unfortunately i don't cover monster creation in this class but i almost feel like i could teach like a whole class about i mean i could tell you everything you want to know about like charisma <laughs> and like what it means or or like how dexterity relates to real world values and stuff like that but um yeah it's it's definitely an important part of understanding the core design of fifth edition 
All right. Uh, note block is going to be kind of like the green pull out one. That's okay with the H5. You can see there it's got the H5 tag on it. Um, page breaks, you, I showed you before, you have to put in a manual page break. If you wanted to have it so it automatically puts in a number on the footer too, you can do a page break with number. Uh, part headers are these kind of these big fancy DMG player's handbook style uh, headers that go up. Uh, usually over like a full page image. Uh, I don't really use them that much, but they do look really pretty. Uh, spell block, if you wanted, to, it'll automatically format all the information you need for a spell block for you. I don't know why I never use this, Sarge, because that's so useful. I always end up typing it manually, and I always forget this is here. I roll. Um, it's because we don't write. It's because we don't make spells. Yeah, I don't. Time. We don't make spells that often. That's because it really. Every do. time we go to make a spell, we're like, the game's already got this. Yeah, that's the problem <laughs> with spells. Is like, what's funny is, in if you if y'all and y'all are grognards, meaning you've been playing this for a long time, you probably remember in like second edition, you had um, there were enough spells to fill like four thick volumes per class. So you would have like four books for wizards and then four books for um, clerics. And that's basically all there were. There was just arcane and divine magic. And um, it was excessive. Like they've done a really good job of like combining a lot of spells and getting rid of like stuff that was like, unne is, like it's not necessary to have both a spell for like antipathy and um, what's the other one? Sympathy. Sympathy, yeah. Like those used to be two different spells. Stone to flesh, flesh to stone were two different spells. And they were just like, okay, we're going to clean all this up. And there was a lot of like really niche stuff that was like, mm, don't really need this. Every single thing that Bigsby's hand can currently do. Yeah, yeah. All of, all, yep. spell. all of Bigsby's hand stuff were a separate spell. So um, they did a really good job of combining that. So honestly, we don't create that many spells unless it's something like super specific. Um, but I feel like anything that you see on TV, like you can go watch WandaVision and you can like anything that they cast in that is in the PHP. You just have to know what it looks like and retheme it um tables so if you want a fancy table you can do that those are the ones that i think you saw uh yeah it'll look like this and you can see in my text that sometimes i'll just do them within the document my yeah like this is perfect example so this is just me manually writing it in the document only because i've done it so many times that i i know the uh <laughs> i know the uh markdown text by heart um couple things about this is important to know is your column headers are always going to be the first two things. You don't have to bold them because it automatically bolds them for you. Um, even though this looks kind of abstract, this is actually telling, this is giving the software information on how it's supposed to be formatted. So you've got these two colons divided by hyphens. It could be any number of hyphens. It doesn't matter. It can go all the way down to one. What does matter are the position of these colons. So if there's two colons, it's going to center everything in it. If it only has the um, uh, left colon, it will left align it. And then if it only has the right colon, it'll right align it. And that's pretty much pretty much all you really need to know with it. Um, I've also you see that I've also put in some other stuff. Uh, oops, that's actually wrong syntax. As I didn't notice that before. Uh, but yeah, like some of the syntax is to create spaces that don't break and stuff like that. That's a little bit more complicated. Um, so I wouldn't stress about it right now. But really, you do that so it doesn't have weird looking breaks all over the place. If you are actually curious about what Dave there, you can search uh, for the HTML code for a non-breaking hyphen. And that's what he's trying to put yeah, in Yeah, non-breaking hyphens and non-breaking spaces. Non-breaking spaces like... That's probably the one next one I use the most, which is um, you can see it disappears, but it ends up creating a space. Um, sometimes you'll need to do that. And then, yeah, the non breaking hyphen is N820, N number 80. Yeah, you don't have to memorize this. You can just search for it online and you can see it creates a hyphen there. This is just um, HTML code, um, which, like, if you're really, if you're like me, like super nerdy about how it looks and like, even like having a wrong indent somewhere, you're like, oh no! Um, that's why I use that stuff there. I wouldn't worry about it starting out. <clears throat> uh, part headers, spell blocks, spell list. Again, this will take ev everything and put it into nice little columns for you so you can have a spell list. Um, your tables, 
and then yeah you got a split table here which is just two columns within one column and then your themes and that's pretty much it other than the snippet tool you've got kind of a shortcut for bold so if i wanted to make this bold do that you can see it adds the two asterisks needed so and it sees it turns it bold there you can also hit control b it does the same thing or command b if you're on a mac and then italics is just one asterisks on the one asterisk on either side of the word you want to do and then b and i three asterisks on either side makes it both bold and emphasized uh, and then if you wanted to do strike through you can do that as well and that just puts the tildes around it so you can see it creates a strike through don't use strike through much unless it's like comical like or uh or you're crossing at a price. I think that's probably the only times I ever use a strike down. And then you've got bullet points if you want as well. Bullet point just creates, you know, helps you divide information up a little bit. And if you want it to be numbered, it also has a numbered um, stuff. But again, if you just type asterisk and space, it'll do the exact same thing for you. And that's pretty much it. Um, the other tools here, you can convert from Homebrewery if you've written something in Homebrewery. You can um, have different editor themes, which really just changes what this looks like here. Uh, I'm boring, and I just keep it to white. <laughs> uh, now I don't know how to get back to white. Oh, no! Uh, there we go. Um, this is the biggest disagreement in the company. Dave is obsessed with using light theme for everything. Everyone else uses dark theme. Man, that's how I started back in the, back in the 90s. You can do a full screen mode. Ooh. Uh, your print, that's pretty important. You can see it's going to create your um, print preview here. And then when you go to print, it's probably going to take a minute to load up because it's a big document. You can either save it as a PDF or you can print it through whatever printer that you want to use. But that's how you get it into a PDF format is going through print. So there's not an actual button for exporting. Um, you can change variables, which I've never messed with. I couldn't tell you what it does. <laughs> but I think it's more for like uh, a little bit more complicated stuff. Um, like if you wanted to have it, like it tells you right up here, easily change words throughout an entire document. If you set a variable town in its definition New York, you could access this variable in the document editor by typing town. And then the preview generator will look through the HTML document, replace all instances of town with New York. Yeah, It's probably a little bit more. I I've never used it. I don't have a need for it. Control F works fine. This, if you want to go uh, back, you and... should tell them about how you um, deal with large documents and how you piece them together. Yeah, that seems to be one thing people come up with a lot. Um, Gene Binder starts to really slow down once it hits 1,000 lines of code. So when your number here gets to about 1,000, it'll be it'll say like 1,000 lines exceeded, um, and it goes into like a, a slow mode where it kind of has to calculate. Like it takes like three seconds to calculate. What I would do is I will divide up my bigger documents. Starting out, you probably won't need to worry about this, but this is when I, you start getting into like writing like like Vasco Valley, which is 127 pages. And I think we finished with what, nine, 10 documents, Serge? Um, you, what I'll do is I'll create individual documents for the pieces, which is also good because it helps you, <clears throat> it helps ensure that nothing gets lost because you do not want to have a 60,000 word adventure vanish because <laughs> of a, uh, you know, uh, um, a bug, but you, I would, um, I will do that. I will save the individual pieces into PDFs and then I'll combine them with software like Adobe Acrobat or, uh, I use small PDF, which allows you basically just to glue all the pieces together once you're done. Um, and again, it's really useful because, you know, instead of having to export like the whole freaking file again. And GM Binder kind of exports files to be somewhat fat. Like this document, even in its size, will probably come out to be north of 10 megabytes, which is pretty heavy for like a three page document. Um, like creating in the individual pieces and reassembling it makes it a lot easier and streamlined for you anyways. But yeah, once you get to a thousand and immediately is like, er, 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 it starts slowing down. So keep it, you'll see that. I think a few people in the chat have been talking about that, like running into that issue. Um, finally, if you want to share a version, you can go to this place here. Whoops. Let me slow down. And I clicked share version or create new version what it does is it creates a link for you where you can copy it and then share it with someone 
And then if you make any updates to it, you can create a new version. And what it does is that that first version I created creates a, a new previous version here, like an archived version, and you get a new link. This is really useful um, within our company for after I've assembled everything in the document, I can share that link with our proofing team and they can go through and make sure that there's no like um, syntax errors or any kind of like uh, formatting mistakes that I might have made. Like I might have missed like a paragraph that spilled over into the um, the third column or whatever. Yeah. So what we do for this, and this is particularly useful, is uh, we'll send it out to proofers. They'll tell us, we've instructed them how to let us know about like this page number, this column, error this. That whenever we accept their edits, we can update the last version and then future proofers will hopefully not note that afterwards, yeah. which allows us to fix these sort of things. But in our process, this is the I will just tell you this part. We like to get the proofs involved twice, sometimes thrice on a product. Um, the first site they'll be involved with the proofing of the document directly in, in Google Docs. This is when we do the most legally because that's the text is most, it's easiest to deal with changing text. We usually restrict the proofers on changing text or major errors once we get to a broadsword or PDF phase, because at that point you're gonna start breaking the layout if we have to modify the text too much. Mm -hmm. So that's something for you to think about as well when you're working with your team. Don't do more work at a time than you want people to modify if you want their help. Yeah. So the easiest time to let people critique your adventure is when you're early in drafts in Google Docs, because once you put it in the GM binder, you probably spent anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours configuring the document to look the way you want. And if one of your proofers point out a huge logic error at that point, that there's a major rewrite, you're going to be pissed. And that can create negative feedback through your review process, because you don't want to have who are helping you keep your content tight, feeling they're being a problem by doing what they're trying to do. So it's very important to cultivate a very positive relationship with, um, it's very important to cultivate a positive relationship with your review team. Apparently my internet is acting up again. Dave is saying I'm broke. Anyways, <laughs> that's GM Binder. It's our tool of preference. It's the one I use mostly for stuff that I put out. Um, granted, like Broadsword uses InDesign and um, any other more like professional, like finished doc or physical documents, I should say, because I try to make <laughs> all my stuff look pre professional, even with GM Binder. Um, that's what we use for it. So if you want to get into the like digital side of, of creating and content and like publishing it through like something like Patreon or drive through RPG or something like that, GM binder is a really good tool to start out with. Um, just because it does basically everything you need to do. And then you can get more complicated, um, programs or more complicated look and design as you move along. Like I went pretty much for <laughs> for uh um like the first three years just using kind of their stock themes and only now have i started writing my own css to do it right lulu um but yeah all right so homework sign up for next week's workshop class where we're going to spend the entire class answering questions and helping you plus we will reveal how you can submit your content for public potential publication and pay Woo so end of the class yeah we're going to be looking to hire some folks um we got some big projects that we want to get done this year and we need some more writers so um those of you who've who've come through and you, this is something you're interested in it's a great way to get started um even if you're like uh, looking to build your own brand we have some folks who work directly with us and who are building their brand while also working with us and earning pay from that so it's kind of a nice little deal uh, if you aren't already signed up with GM Binder, sign up as ASAP. It's free and it's pretty nifty. Oh, excuse me. Up, up late last night writing. <laughs> Format your adventure with GM Binder. You're free to use other content management systems if you like. So if you prefer to use InDesign or Affinity or something else, you can do that. 
Uh, make sure that you refer or review everything that you've learned in the class because next week will be there'll be a test. No, there's no test, but <laughs> the, well, the the, te the test is submitting it and seeing whether or not we uh, we uh, extend you an offer. <laughs> As a note, folks who would like to potentially submit content for consideration to the DM Dave or Broadsword Writing team, uh, the content must be a third level editor balanced for four characters with maximum word count of 2,950 words, not including special characters. And we'll have details on how to submit, where to submit that to. Please don't ping us <laughs> or send us email because we'll be like, ah! Um, and we don't have a CS person at the moment either. So we'll answer, we'll answer questions in the in the Discord channel on these things. Yeah, uh, but that is the limit. Yep, yep. Um, and then if you are in the content creator class, be sure to join us in the Discord so we can start issuing assignments. I know some people have said that they are not a Discord user. I just I don't use Discord. Like, um. But uh, uh, we will have methods for contacting out. Likely, I think Sarge and I discussed it, we'll probably have roughly the same schedule here where it's going to be Saturdays and Mondays, um, starting with the Saturday class first. Um, so we will have some signups for that. If you haven't already signed up for the content class and you're interested in like building your own brand and stuff, highly recommend you sign up. This will probably be the last week that it's offered. Uh, just because we want to kind of keep it a small, close-knit class. Right now, we've got about 100 people in it. So that's about a tenth of what we had starting with the, uh, uh, what you call it, the, <laughs> this class. Um, so uh, it's a little bit easier for us to, like, talk to people and answer questions directly versus, you know, kind of having to field questions and go with it like that. Um, so, yeah, definitely, if you are already signed up for that, be sure to... Yeah, I put the offer up for you. Be sure to uh, um, do that now, or, or at least get into the Discord so we can start communicating with you. Otherwise, just message one of us at, um, you can message logistics at dmdave.com if you have questions about the content class. But yeah, uh, that's it. I think we're going to spend the last hour some fielding questions from you guys and seeing what you're interested in and knowing a little bit more about. And uh, uh, did you already put up the link for the next week, Sarge? Sorry, just says thumbs up. I think he's frozen. I did, but I think my internet. I've been having internet issues all morning. Okay, Let, I'll, 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 I guess I'll take questions. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I uh, mean, I'm here. I can hear well. I think my upload is going to shit. Uh, Oren, I think the reason that it looks like the Oren asked that the next session is delivery an hour later. That's because we're having daylight savings here in the U S which if you're in Europe, um, it's going to be a different time for you. So the answer is yes, it will be an hour later for you. Just not for us. <laughs> I mean, Oren asked why the times look correct. The time that you see on your invite is correct yeah. for your time, for your specific location. Yeah. It's daylight. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we created daylight savings time for weird farming related reasons, I believe. I mean they have it, it in Europe. It's different across they, the they have it in Europe. It's just it's like it's like a week or two later. So yeah, it'll be it'll be later for you guys, but we'll we'll already look tired from having to suffer from awful spring ahead. Ugh. Yeah, I mean the light's nice, but come on, I want that hour of sleep. Uh, Tim asked which channel we're gonna be talking about these things in. We're always gonna focus on the energy on the how to write tabletop adventures. Uh, channel for these sort of things. Uh, all the rest of our channels are more for our patrons to just hang out and talk about the game. So yeah. And information related to this class is open to all members who have checked the registered box in our in our Discord. If you do not see the How to Write Tabletop Adventures channel, go to the DM Dave Landing channel, read the rules, and check the box. Yep. Um. Let's see. I really, I th really think we should do a class on monsters, Sarge. That seems to be our number one. Uh, Marshall asks, "How do you?" I mean, we were trying to keep this more generic when we started this. We can do a five E ride monster writing class. Yeah, I mean, one. trust me, I could, we could talk all about five E design. Um, Marshall asks, "How do we get our awesome artwork?" All right, so I, I think we we talked about this on Monday, right, Sarge? So, um. We starting out got 
a lot of artwork from um, stock resources, primarily Shutterstock, as well as um, Drive Through RPG, which seems to have pretty good ones. And then we also found some like creators who have like Patreons that offer their stuff as um, stock art. So super useful. Um, nowadays, you know, we've got what, what three artists who work on contract um who create art pretty regularly um for the team um they're they're pretty busy so don't try to steal my artists <laughs> uh, <laughs> i will be very upset um uh, yeah they, we've got we've got a few people around the world who um help us with regular art for broadsword monthly but my recommendation is if you're gonna hire an artist make sure you pay them what they're worth um like nothing is worse than like seeing an artist shortchange for their job i don't negotiate prices often with i they pretty much i'm like hey man what do you charge per image they tell me the price i don't try to beat them down it either works for my budget or it doesn't because you know like that's they they create their value not me and i don't want to like make them i don't want to cheapen their efforts so if they're worth what they tell me like that's it um but having said that, art can be expensive, especially when you're just starting out. I mean, you're you're going to be looking at, you know, probably a hundred dollars or more per image, even for black and white. So that can really raise your cost if you're trying to build a brand versus doing Shutterstock or something like that. But of course, you always want to like like Shutterstock is like, even though Shutterstock's not cheap, you do get like, I don't know, like fifty images for. I don't even know anymore. It's just a bill at this point. <laughs> It's Shutterstock is not cheap <laughs> either, but it's it's closer to like two dollars an image versus that. Also, drive through RPGs stock images are relatively inexpensive. You can get some badass art that's a little bit more focused for. Um, I mean, some of the cover art we get is like fifteen dollars for a lifetime license, so it's pretty cool. We will stress that you do need to pay for the license to the stock. Yeah, you can't just go to Google and just start ripping images down. Yes, don't do that. Unless you go to like, you want to get yourself iced out of the TTRPG space in a hurry. Violate, yeah, the contract with artists. Yeah, anytime. Few things will get you iced out of an entire creative community faster than violating the trust of artists. Yeah, and you want to anytime you post on social media, I'll always tag whoever's art you're using. Um, same goes with like any comics or stuff you share. Like you always want to always want to make sure that people are aware of the actual artists that create the stuff that you're creating, because, you know, this is your full-time job, especially if they're commission-based um, primarily, which a lot of the artists who we work with are. It's, um, it's important that you do that, but that comes with, yeah, that's, yeah, like I said, I would say stay with uh, stock to begin with. And then when you can't afford better art, you know, get it. Uh, is it link is up for next week? Yeah, it's up for next week. Uh, it's at the top. Uh, due date for submission of assignment. Uh, it'll be at the end. We'll 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 give the due date next week. More details next week. Don't yeah, worry about yeah, it. yeah. It's not ready. We just yet. needed to. We needed to. We have a lot of other stuff we're working on as well in the background. So we needed to create breathing room for me and Laura to be able to uh, absorb yeah. some of those submissions. Uh, Zoltan's asking if we need to include art in the submissions. Absolutely not, because you're going to be submitting stuff to us through. Google Doc, basically, and we're just going to be reviewing the content of your adventure. Yeah, you don't have to make it's it look pretty. We just want to make sure. The biggest thing is, and I, I'm, we're going to be straight up with you, like, we can tell if somebody followed our steps just by opening a doc and, and putting our eyes on it for two seconds. Um, and it's really important. Like, we're not trying to, like, stifle anyone's creativity, but we've got a rather large organization with some pretty, pretty heinous deadlines. Um, keep, like, to put it in perspective, Dungeon Magazine what came out for... God, almost 20 years, and it only came out every other month, and it was a third of the size of Broadsword. Uh, we come out monthly, and our book is like 120 to 150 pages with no ads, um, two columns, you know, <laughs> you know, 500 to 1,000 words a page. So we we ain't got no time to <laughs> jack around. <laughs> so that's that's the biggest thing is when we get into writing, like some of the basic stuff we can we can coach on. Like, um, you know, like being aggressive with traps. God, I think that's probably the one we have to coach everybody on. But like, um, no, what is a trap versus what is a hazard? Hazard doesn't warn anyone. Yeah. Hazard, you can see it and be like, <laughs> oh, what's all this yellow stuff? I'm going to walk into it. Ah, this yellow stuff is bad. Um, that's pretty much every hazard in D&D. &D. Um, uh, but yeah, really. Eric asked about 
know about maps. Um, if it's in the Google Doc, just add the image inside yeah. the Google. Oh, hey guys, too. If you if you send it private, it's going to be hard for us to answer sometimes because we might not see it. But I'm going to answer one of Ben's questions here. He sent to me. Uh, he says, "How do you add images into GM Binder, like with the cool splatter watermark effect?" So, the 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 cheesy way of doing it that I see a lot of people do is it's kind of it's kind of hard to explain. Like they'll put the image that they want at the top, and then they overlay over top of it using the Z index feature in GM Binder to cr like basically overlay another type a PNG that where it's cut out with the watermark effect. I don't do that because it really like like it's hard to like finesse with. I will create the images in Photoshop, but if, I understand not everybody's savvy in Photoshop because God knows Photoshop is way more complicated than it probably needs to be. But um, that is how how most folks do it. They they take like they take the image, they put it where they want it, and then they get a, another image that's like a fake page. Lay that over top of that image so only the the original image is sticking out above it, and then they put the text over top of that. If that makes sense. Um, I want to say, does Home Brewery have that built in? I don't think so. I recommended it to Levi's team. I was like, you guys should put this in because everybody wants it. Like, <laughs> like it's a really nice feature. But yeah, I, I do all mine manually. I guess I'll go over a couple of questions related to the map, the adventure submission stuff, real quick. Things that you want, like, easy success with the DM Dave team. Stick to the standard reference document. If you want to put in a custom monster, if you absolutely cannot run your adventure without a custom monster in it, you may only submit one custom monster. But the fastest way to get yourself sort of frowned on in the submission process is to submit a custom monster that is not balanced appropriately. And then we're going to be like, mm because you didn't find something that was already balanced within the SRD, and then you made us, you made us work with the monster that we then have to fix, that adds work to the, the board. So you will want to focus on a 2,950 word adventure for tier one characters. I recommend targeting level three for four characters. And you're gonna focus on running a location-based adventure, primarily using standard OGL creatures within the standard reference document or the system reference document. As for numbering the walls, you can look at Dave's uh, video on YouTube. He's had a couple of them. Um, the easiest way to do it is just, just start at the front door and follow the left wall and number your rooms that way. Yeah, numbering is, it's like an art and a science. Um, generally you start, you, you, you wanna follow the most logical path they're gonna follow. And the reason you do that is because when you go to write the adventure, you want it so that the DM isn't having to hop back and forth to go all over the place. Like Don John, I don't know how they <laughs> number their stuff, but they'll put the numbers like all over the place. Uh, you don't want that. You want it to the old school parties tend to follow the left wall or basically move clockwise through the dungeon and raster through every single possible nook and cranny. Um, you do that up until the point where there's like little offshoot rooms that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to. And then you might like if there's a room on the right and it's just on the right there you might number that room first or if there's like a secret door or something. But yeah, it's just one of those things where experience, but yeah, typically go clock, start from the main, the entrance they're most likely to enter through and go clockwise until you get all of them. Uh, Kyle's asking about where to get battle mats. Um, you can make your own in dungeon draft. Dyson Logos has an, has a huge array of commercially available maps. That you can yeah, but I'm Battle Mats, so he's more of a dungeon guy. Um, yeah. yeah, Battle Mats are going to be, I mean, there's, can't spit without hitting the Battle Mat in this market. Um, yeah, I mean, really, it's just, <laughs> really, a lot of the Patreon um, uh, uh, creators will have commercial licenses for their Battle Mats, like G and Peku do. Uh, I'm trying to think of some others. I don't know. A bunch of them do. <laughs> yeah, like there's I said. A lot of them. Yeah, there's there's Tom no. Cardos has some. There's yeah. Ori, the cartographer, who's out there. Mad cartographer has some. Yeah, there's no shortage of the battle mats. Has some. Typically, they will limit what you can and can't do with them. So make sure that you're very clear on those agreements, because um, some of the agreements are not always great. Like we will specifically avoid certain things. Like, mm, this agreement seems sketch. We're not going to use it. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a matter of like 
looking at it and trying to understand it. And most of these guys are like, I mean, they're just people. You just reach out and be like, hey, can I use this? And like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind, like what I do and what I use should not be like I've got a very large organization and a single email from me. It can be a very good day for some of these creators. So <laughs> like it's uh, um, don't go with like I wouldn't like look at what I'm doing and try to like copy it because like I'm a little bit further down the t turnpike. But having said that, there are a lot, a lot of resources out there. Uh, somebody asked for the prices of Shutterstock, uh, Alejandro did. Uh, let's see, single user, you can either get on-demand packs, which costs you like 30 bucks, but you have full license, and that gets you two images. <sighs> um, I have a subscription for 350, but you can get a subscription for 10 images, 50 images, 350, and 750 for a single user. The um, and keep in mind, guys, I am not affiliate with them. They don't even have an affiliate program. Those jerks. <laughs> but um, the only one thing that really stinks about Shutterstock is your images don't roll over. So be sure that even if you don't use all the ones you want to use, that you end up downloading at the end of the month whatever it is that you uh, want to get. <laughs> Uh, Tim's asking if we're going to talk about Roll20 in the content creator class. Uh, that's a good question. Maybe. Probably. Uh, well, the content creator class is also going to be a little bit more open than just like just fifth edition content. I mean, I've I've been a content creator in many different fields and found success pretty much in every field that I've started. So a lot of it's going to be like showing you what you can do. And probably when I get into like marketplaces, um and how to navigate those that's when we'll talk about that um we're still trying to decide how i'm kind of playing in my head how i want to organize content oh if you go to our discord channel by the way for the um the content creators class um i have been asking people directly like what do you want to learn in this class granted most people have kind of the same thing but um like the way i'm kind of thinking about it right now so probably be like a day on like social media there'll be a day on like um marketplaces um kickstarters you know things like that but uh yeah roll 20 is kind of a beast unto itself it's pretty easy to get on um roll 20 the way it's and i'll just tell you guys the way it's formatted is that um your products are most successful the moment they launch because they appear on the front page um but unless you have like a big follower base or you have a ton of products in there it's it's you know it's it becomes trickle down so like week one is like yeah and then it's like um, we had some products that turned out to be evergreen, so they continue to sell month to month. Um, and we're always trying to like bottle lightning with that, you know, trying to repeat the. There's a there's a lot of little considerations when you're dealing with virtual tabletops versus just publishing your adventure because when you're publishing a virtual tabletop, you have to first understand how users are interacting with the software. And yeah. what what are the pain points of those users? Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole other skill set. Sure you, and how do you address those? Like, if you look at any of our content on Roll Twenty, particularly made within the last two or three months, you can see sort of the evolution of that because our content looks the same each time. That's on purpose. That's the reason why we're very strict about how we present content. Um, I like I, I don't want to go into screen, but that's the biggest thing when you're writing collaboratively with other people. Uh, the reason information is presented the same way all the time is because we, even if we're all writing different stuff, we're all serving a common customer. So our customers have been taught how to read fifth edition or whatever system you're writing for. Our customers have been trained how to read fifth edition by Wizards of the Coast and the DM Dave organization. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we always go preamble, background, adventure hooks, adventure summary, uh, adventure summary hooks, opening scene, location, is because that's how our readers expect to read the content. It makes it easy for them to navigate. And so every adventure isn't a burden for the, G for the GM to run because if you're writing content professionally, the person who you're not fighting the players in your content. You're trying to help the game master or the dungeon master who's reading your stuff. The harder you make your stuff for the GM to read and understand, the less likely they are to purchase your stuff again because that was not an easy thing for them to use. Mm -hmm. 
whenever you hear me push back upon something, I say, this is too complicated or this is illegible. It's because we want the content to be easy to run for the person who paid us for the, for the session they want to run for their friends. Yeah. Yeah. And we're really, we're really amping up and trying to create like products that really stand out in the marketplace too. So the, le the more we can have, the less we have to think about like, getting the content right and the more we can think about like how to effectively market it and present it um the better for you because the way we work is pretty much once you give our content we'll try to have it like once you turn an adventure with us we'll try to have it live on roll 20 so you can start making money like like within three within days yeah within a week of it yeah, within a week. and we we work we have a great relationship with them we absolutely love our friends at roll 20. um yeah i mean you know, people are like, oh, I want to shoot Foundry. Well, we've got a Foundry license, so we'll be going to be doing that too soon. <laughs> um, but the, uh, um, like, Roll20 is, like, we really love working with them. And I think they love working with us because um, we've created some just home run products for them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all about keeping that relationship intact. Ta-da! 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave will be using GM Binder for Morlock Retreat. You probably won't see him write in GM Binder for the that set that bit because that's more of like a like a house game he's running. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole. So if you guys are watching the um my world building series, um, I might do it like that. Problem is, I, I don't own the rights to the maps, even though I'm the, a big part of me just wants to message like Dyson and be like. All right, how much do you want? <laughs> or do you like because like, <laughs> I, I talked to him I talked to him about it before and he told me what somebody once offered him. And I was like, I was like, oh, that sounds like a reasonable price. He was like, it was too cheap. I'm like, oh, that's a terrible price. Like <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, it's 31 maps, so I would have to buy like a significant license. And Dyson is, you know, he's a he's uh, I mean, I wouldn't say he's like a household name. He's not like I don't think as many people know him as like Mike Schley. But definitely, he can call up a good price because his work is pretty good, and you know he's a wizard to the coast cartographer. So, having said that, there will probably be a point where I'm like, all right, fine, write a check. Here you go. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, world building. Um, yeah, I probably won't be able to write it with that. I'll probably turn some of the other. Like I don't know how. I can't remember how far in the series I am right now. I've already filmed up to like episode 32. So um, some of the world building stuff I'll probably put in there because it plays into some of the dark fantasy stuff that I've been writing lately. Um, but yeah, I would love to be able to write the maps. It's just that I couldn't publish it professionally. Um, but we'll see. Dot, dot, dot. Any other questions, Sash? What else do people want to know? Uh, let's see. Like you guys can ask us questions. We wanted to make sure we gave time. If you guys have any questions about stuff we talked about over the past here, feel free to jump in. Uh, Eric's asking about reflavoring a goblin. Uh, he used a bugbear chief and is looking for like an SRD replacement. Let me talk about bugbear chief. Uh, and see what you know work. what I do? So th I run into this all the time. Is I just take an NPC and an NPC block that is SRD and just add in its features. And there's a um. There's a, if you aren't sure which features are specific to monsters on page um, 282 of the DMG, it gives you all the stuff that you're supposed to add in when you convert. So I would just like for a bugbear chief, which I think is what CR2, I just take like CR3. CR, oh, even better. Then I would just take a veteran and give it bugberry stuff and be done. Veteran, yeah. or I mean, you could go gladiator. Gladiator is CR five, maybe a bandit captain. Bandit captain CR two. Um, so any of those would work. That's that's pretty much what you do when you can't use the uh, the bonus versions. I'm thinking like I think bugbear chiefs have three good saves or at least two good saves um, since they're bandit, mini bugbear chiefs are pretty tough. What's it? Yeah, they're they're mini bosses. Um, for low level parties because they have good saves. So I think Bandit They're strong physical saves, yeah. Yeah, Bandit Captain would probably be the best one to take and like add in some stuff because bugbears are like weird like hybrid of like stealth and strength. Mm -hmm. They have expertise in stealth. Class and homebrewing monsters. Yeah, I think we do need to do a monster class. I think that would be a pretty good idea. 
Well, uh, custom NPCs don't count against your work count, but Broadsword also doesn't pay you for custom creatures either. So you're yeah. not rewarded for giving us like 30 monsters because no, God, please don't give us. Pay you it for, takes so long to format monsters. monsters. <laughs> yeah, we we don't like. There's two reasons we don't like like we we don't mind like a few custom monsters, but there's a main reasons. There's two main reasons why we don't do a lot of custom monsters. One it takes a really long time to set up in roll 20 and can really slow the whole process down. So that's one reason. And I've got three people who work in Roll20. If they're all working on the same project because he gave us 30 monsters, chances are it's going to get cut. I'm going to be like, nope, move on. Um, two, most of your DMs are weekend DMs, um, with meaning like they don't do a ton of prep and they may not necessarily know how every monster in the, the book functions. Or they, they know how the monsters in the, in the monster manual functions, but that's about it. You know, they've read Keith the Mons, like... The monsters know what they're doing and they're good if you throw in a lot of different stuff it's creating like a whole new set of monsters for them to have to learn and like while someone like myself and sarge can grok a monster block and like figure out how it works pretty fast i would say the average dm can't do that so by using a goblin instead of you know a gerfuffle or whatever you want to make you're just making the the, you're making the dm's job easier and that's ultimately what we always want to do is try to make it as easy as we can for the dm Yeah. Yeah. CT. Again, like that's the point. Like again, like I've explained this to some of the writers before. Like I, D and D. There's D and D. Oh, I don't want to go too philosophical on this. D and D is a game that is greater than the sum of its parts. It has a lot of modular components that work really well. It has a couple of big rules to contain the scope of things to make sure that the the game plays consistently across groups, but. We like if you need the custom monster that badly, you got to refigure out what you're talking about in this adventure, because you've already provided the the game master with a custom experience by writing an adventure. The GM already needs to absorb usually about three thousand words a session to effectively run a single session of com com uh, like of content. That's the secret reason why we're like sub three thousand is the goal. Because that's about the amount of rooms and scenes that a GM is going to deploy in front of a player group in two to three hours of content, plus whatever silliness the party introduces to the game hmm. for another hour. Mm -hmm. And that's where this comes through. And you'll see this again with like as you move to tier two content, because um, a single tier two adventure section is usually about a level's worth of content which is three adventuring days worth of experience, which is three sessions, which is yeah. just under 9,000 words. Yeah, tier two is, is the longest, by the way, of to level of all the tiers. Um, it usually takes three sessions in every tier two, and then it slows down, or it speeds up again in tier three. But there's certain design reasons and philosophies for that too, <laughs> which we won't go into. Uh, somebody asked about changing the spells. Tim asked about changing spells. Yes, you can. Keep in mind, though, um, if it changes the damage it does significantly up or down, may affect its CR. So, like, um, the mage, for example, has a reason. The yeah, yeah, the mage, mage is CR six, but bard is CR four. Yeah, the mage has um cone of cold, but if like you change that cone of cold to like you know another CR five spell, like. I don't know, like pass wall or something that doesn't really do any damage. It's going to greatly affect the overall damage output and likely probably drop your mage down. I'd, I'd say maybe even all the way down to four, which then will adjust all your proficiency bonuses and like and so on. And so, on. so it's a, uh, uh, it, it could be kind of touchy there, but if it's like, like thematically, if like you're like switching it for, you know, if you're switching darkness for, I don't know, Bane, you know, that's fine. Yeah, just just keep in mind that the, the two levers all monsters have to move up and down that change its CR are going to be its damage output and uh, defensive capabilities. Those calculators can sometimes be wrong, Tim. So you want to make sure you review the uh, yeah the rules in the creating a monster section. Yeah, Those are great places to start, but you got to be able to read the math yourself. Yeah, keep in mind, too, that Wizards of the Coast... Um, does a lot of what's called like ivory tower um, math. Like what they tell you to use is not what they use. So you will find that especially like in low levels, I'd say the CRs are especially like sub CR four 
Um, a lot of that works within the the rules they give in the DMG. But once it starts getting higher up, it really starts being like kind of all over the place. Um, I don't know if that's through playtesting or that's them just being like, hey, hey whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> It doesn't mean it doesn't mean CRs are useless. CRs are important because they at least can help um, the the DM gauge how relatively difficult something is. But um, yeah, especially for lower levels, I try to get your CR as close as possible to what it's supposed to be. Yeah, like if you're gonna look for a common replacement, use monsters that are similar. Like if you're looking to tweak a spellcaster, I would look across the breadth of D&D to see what other comparable spellcasters are doing, and you can use that as a baseline. If you're trying to change out one brawler for another, because you want to use a monster manual version of a monster, find SRD equivalents and tack on stuff. Like, we did that recently with, like, a Sahuigan. We just tacked on Sahuigan stuff to a gladiator to create a mini-boss Sahuigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. The NPC blocks are pretty good for that. Um more than anything. And that's pretty much the only time I'll ever create something special if I absolutely have to is if I need a um elite NPC because none of the elite NPCs with the exception of like mummy lords and like I think that's it, right? Mummy lords. <laughs> um you don't you don't get access to because of the SRD. Kind of sucks, but you know. They gave us another 300 monsters to play, so I won't complain too much. Something must be going on with my mic today. I don't know if it's my connection or if it's my uh -huh. microphone dying. I'll test this later in Discord. Sarge is falling into the upside down. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, I'm going to have to hang Christmas lights to communicate with him. With him. <laughs> uh, any any other? Wow, we got we got like 30 minutes here. Come on, uh, yeah. Is there a difference between the adventure endings and the aftermath? Um, it's just Alejandro. That just probably is like whatever I was reading at the time. And <laughs> these days, I think I put a conclusion. I put adventure conclusion, right? Most of the time. Lately, we've been doing the the writers do concluding the quest. I think that's their secret way of getting three words for one. I prefer after. No, no, I put because... I put concluding the quest because I don't want to confuse between um the adventure and then the quests, but. Yeah. Information yeah. architecture, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I I don't know. Lately, I've been copying the formatting that's in Rhyme. So, like, Rhyme has, like, how to run this chapter. And I, I write a lot longer stuff, too, than many of the other writers do. I've been focusing more on, like, multi-level content. So, like, when I've been writing, like, Queen of the Shadows last night, like, instead of saying, like, adventure summary, I'll be, like, running this chapter and, like, tells the DM how to run it effectively. That's a little bit more complicated stuff. Like with your basic like one session adventures, you know, like a 3000 word adventure, adventure summary is really all you need. And um... basically like a big part of what we cultivate first is you got to walk before you can run. Yeah. You got to be able to assemble a solid tier one single session adventure. And you build upon that as you get to the later tiers of play. Yeah. We, we found like really early on, we started with a lot of different writers who brought a lot of different strengths to the table, but they were there were a lot of fundamentals that we take for granted because we've written so much stuff yeah. that we also have to train in the people. And you got to be able to learn how to cut stuff when you're trying to make stuff fit because we have word counts for a reason because we publish books and that means that there is a hard limit to how big a book can be because you have to pay to ship it to people so <laughs> there's a reason for some of that stuff yep and it's the same thing with the monsters like we only allow like usually one custom monster per adventure or at least per like session per like writer because we have multiple writers on the team. So if we have to deal with possibly yeah. anywhere from seven to 12 custom monsters, that adds time to the it board. It becomes tragedy and of the commons. We have to come to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, get, we get crushed by lots of little things piling up. And that's why we talk a lot about the modular nature of 5e and how the whole is bigger than an individual quest or an individual encounter or an individual scene. Yeah. It's the collective content that builds up the adventure and again there are four 
to eight players at most people's tables these days. The players are in charge of the story. The entire game is whatever those weirdos decided they were going to do that day. Like, Dave wrote a very straightforward adventure, and we died to a waterfall last, last Saturday. They did. <laughs> it, it, whole table of experienced people jumped off a cliff down a waterfall. Lost our warlock. It was amazing. <laughs> I w- it wasn't even, like, hard DCs, y'all. It was, like, 15. I get multiple chance. Like, I got tpk on a waterfall. All they had to do is like, all they had to do is like walk, like left, a hundred feet. Like, and they're like, oh, there's a door. What happened in that session? My level one rogue, twenty five movement speed, running from Grix, ringing a bell. Ling, 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 ling. Help. help me out here! Help. <laughs> Embarrassing. Anyway, sorry, this crack team of adventurers dies to a waterfall. Yeah, that's level one for you, man. <laughs> um, we were just kind of dumb, Zoltan. I was playing a scout for the first time, and I was bad at it. Yeah, yeah. If we were level one, Jody, nobody could turn into anything. Tessa had a good question. I've gotten the DM in the past few months. Do you have any advice? I would say... Um, start off by running content out of the box. Um, like a starter set or I Spire Peak are really good places to start because they help you learn some of the basics. I'd say my pers- my personal opinion is Fandelver is a better starter, even though the, me- the story is a little messier. Um, it really does a good job of like introducing like this is an encounter, this is a small dungeon, this is a town, this is a bigger dungeon, this is hex crawling. You know, like all in the um order in which you should kind of learn to do stuff. Yeah. I mean, even I would, you know, I, I would say her name, but I used to have a friend whose name was Joao, Joao, and I used to mispronounce it horribly all the time, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll call you uh, John. That's, <laughs> but yeah, like he says, oh, no. read the DMG. Well, that's what he told me. That's what my friend Joao told me to call him. But anyways, um, about I, my Portuguese sucks. <laughs> Oi, to the bomb, you will say, <laughs> um, but the, uh, um, yeah, I would say run one of those those basic ones, um, basic sets. Those really like, especially Fandelver. Um, my opinion, Sarge will probably say I Spire Peak, but I think Fandelver's a little more solid. Is it's if, if think... you're not experienced as a DM and you're on I Spire, you're gonna kill some people. <laughs> I think. I think. The starter set adventure is really solid and I think creates a long-term, more robust experience to build off of if the, the GM learns how to write and run content afterwards. I think the Essentials Kit is an interesting starting point for 5th Edition now because it reflects a player-first approach to design because the players are given very clear quests and the players have more say and what they want to do. I think the starter set can be a little obtuse sometimes and what the players maybe should be Yeah, about. that's why I said the story is not as great because it's like, why do we want to go by, beat this guy up? Um, whereas I Spire might be a little bit more clear on that, but... I, I think I will say this. If you're going to run the starter set, hand players the starter set characters or at least force them to incorporate their hooks into their characters. Because I don't think the starter set plays very well with completely custom characters, because the personal quests the starter set characters have encourage them to go places in world more beyond the main arc. Um, let's see. Uh, Ricky, keep in mind anything you give your villain is probably going to end up in the hands of your player. So there's no problem with that. It's just, do you want to give that to the players? <laughs> when you roll your treasure hoard roll for that adventure and you're like, wow, that's a powerful item, beat them up with it first. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. That's, that's the thing about magic items. Remember, anything, anything you give a monster is going to end up in the hands. Like, technically, I think almost all drow are supposed to carry magic items. Like that's a, a rule that's in the book. Like their their magic items fall apart in the sun, but um, like if you read it, there's a little side block on that. 
I didn't notice that until the other day too, which I mean, I've read the monster manual a hundred times. I'm like, Oh really? Hmm. Um, and then like gif have like plus three swords just or they're, they're knights. Just like, yeah, I'm just chilling with my plus three great swords. They only work for them. And if you walk around with one, every gif in yeah. the universe will kill you <laughs> for it. Uh, Jody has a fun question. That I always love is any advice for dealing with difficult argumentative players at the table? Yeah. It's pretty much like this. And I first say like, Hey, you're creating a negative experience for everybody here. I might need you to chill this out. If they continue, I boot them because the reality is there are a lot fewer DMs in the world than there are players. And it's a game and everybody should have fun. And if some one person is creating a toxic experience, they got to go. Um, I've kicked players out before. It's not easy, but it's necessary because otherwise like it's like you have two choices you can do you can pull the band-aid off and get rid of a, a troublesome player or you can continue to have them and everybody has a bad time so that's kind of the fourth edition dmg had some decent advice for that at first like if you have a rules lawyer who's hell bent on making sure every ruling is correct freeze them out of the game during that like all right if you want to go look that up you go do look that up you're out of the game for now yeah, and then you just keep playing. You completely skip their turns. You don't attack their character. You just zone them out of play the entire time they want to focus on a rule. Yeah, because if the rule is more important than play, then they can go do that while everybody else continues the game. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, but like I said, my, yeah, like I'm, I like my basic rule for my players is: if you want to argue with me about rules, and we'll spend an hour figuring out how a rule works outside of game, that is how the world functions thereafter. Mm -hmm. So, like, my players got into it. They fell into their own argument with themselves about how the line of sight rules and the origination of a spell works with things like spirit guardians. Because one of their clerics tried to argue that spirit guardians goes around corners. And then the party, recognizing they were about to go into a temple full of clerics that were going to kill them, argued against that interpretation because they did not want that inflicted yeah. on their front line. Yeah. I mean, but really, it's like rules. Like the rules are important, but they shouldn't detract from the game. And if everything devolves into like a rules argument, you know, you just pull out your DM card and be like, hey, this is my role. This is the way it's going to be. Like I, I have ended a group because there was a rule in particular that I thought was negative for the game. And I was like, I'm, I'm getting rid of this. And the players argued with me about it. And I was like, look, there's no argument. It's either it's going to be this way or we're not going to play. And they continued, and I said, okay, that's it. And then I started a new group. <laughs> um, but like I said, like there's no, it's a game, and you need to have fun too as a DM. And toxic players, sometimes they don't even know they're toxic, so you just approach them and talk to them about it. If they continue, just be like, well, you know, it's great, but I don't think, you know, you know I really appreciate you playing and what you've brought, but it's clear that my style of playing doesn't max with yours, so maybe we should part ways. And that's it. I actually had that happen with um, my best friend's husband when he was playing at our table. He's a very loud and aggressive video game player. And so whenever he ex experiences a negative outcome in a video game, he tends to shout and call the game bullshit. And he brought this energy to D&D &D at first. And I had to pull him aside and very quick, very directly and say, this is a game that I am running. I am also a player at the table. When you are shouting negative things about the game the whole time, you were shouting negative things about the game I set up to run for you, which makes me feel shitty as the person who put hours of effort into making sure this would function for you all. Yeah. Particularly when I'm running content that's designed to challenge you. Like, there's a percentile chance you will succeed from one action to the next. Failure is built into the design. Stop making me feel bad for just running D&D. Yeah. And he chilled out on that because he recognized that's what it was happening. Like, yeah. Yelling, this is bullshit at Bioware or Bungie or Activision is fine. Yelling bullshit at your dungeon master is cruel. Yeah, like, um, yeah, I don't really have much more to add to what Sarge just said. But yes, that. <laughs> like, I, I... Just tell them to chill out. If they don't chill out, kick them out. Yeah, I'm a little bit more... I think I'm probably more harsh than most people because I just don't have time to deal with it. And boy, oh boy, do I hate arguing like semantics. It's just like, guys, this is the way I'm rolling it. Let's move. <laughs> but um, I would say the big thing at my table is I don't let players interfere with my rulings unless they're defending themselves. 
and I encourage the party to self-regulate. So, like, I don't mind when players check over each other's features. Like, I reward players for checking each other because I tend to trust them more. So, like, at my table, if we're not playing on a system that checks your concentration for you, players usually supervise each other's concentration because it makes me more willing to deal with a player when they feel like they need to correct me on a ruling because they need to defend themselves. Like, all right, look, I have slow fall, so, like, I did not take 50 damage, okay? <laughs> but, like, I'll let a player get away with that if they've also been, like, I did this to one of our players at Ducky's table. He was trying to style a little bit and ended his rage early to re-rage. And I was like, you don't have rage anymore because you ra you used your bonus action to de-rage. You cannot rage again. And they were like, oh, oh, shit, that's right. 20 damage the next round went unconscious. But, like, your DM will trust you more for rulings if you're egalitarian about it. But no, don't let toxic players break down your table. You talk to them once and then kick them out. Yeah. I don't have a three strikes rule. I talk to you once and if you're still being an asshole, get out. Same. Yeah. I've I mean, even even with patrons, like we have patrons like people like paying to be in the games, like I uh, mean, I don't care. Like if you're making the game crappy for everybody, it's like get out of here. Like I don't need this shit. <laughs> Oh, I really hate when people... <laughs> we're not going to talk about the rule, Eric. It's going to start at... We only have 15 minutes left. We're not going to talk about the rule. <laughs> oh, I don't even know any rules. Well, uh, oh, oh. oh. I'll, man, I'll tell you, man. I'll tell you. It, oh, it, Lord. Here we no, go. No. Does anyone else have questions that you want to get you in can, while you, Dave goes on this? You one? can ask me in Discord. <laughs> I will tell you all about the, the, the spell that I hate more than anything in this game. God, it's so bad. And horses. Mm, horses. I hate them. <laughs> not funny uh shrine of the emperor eric's asking for adventures you can look at shrine of the emperor of bones yeah. calder fiel calder fiel's a little long um chicken lich creed of <laughs> layer of the chicken lich yeah it's called the lost castle of dreams i think yeah. on the uh on the archive it was so much fun um, when you rebranded it <laughs> lost castle of dreams no, nah, I don't mind. Shrine of the Emperor. I don't mind Goodberry, Bone. Alejandro. Uh, Frozen Maw. Nah. The Blind Cavern. Um. Pretty much anything from any of the creators of the last month or two. Yeah. 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 Anybody. Anything in Vasco Valley that's um in chapters one and two. Like just the individual event quests themselves are pretty, like, simple. Less than three thousand words. Everybody wants to know which quest, which spell I hate the most, Sarge. I'm just gonna type it out. We're not gonna talk about it extensively here. Ugh. We can talk about this in Discord more extensively. Um, it and conjure spells cause the most frustration for us in the game. We do not like. Yeah, them. but animate objects is this is so bad. It's such oh goodness, so bad. No. Uh, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. <sighs> oh, Autumn asked a question about CR. Hold on, let's pull this up before we, we lose time here. Autumn's asked, in the CR guidelines, they recommend not having a CR higher than the level of your characters, but uh, they noticed that we seem to ignore it, and it seems a bad idea at higher levels. So you can get away with running high CR creatures at a party. The reason why they often recommend you not do that is they can usually down a player with their action. Yeah. And that can create like blowback experiences because high CR creatures relative to the party's current level can usually, their damage output per round is usually higher than the hit point average of a single player at your table. And it can be really disconcerting for the party's paladin to just get one shot by a creature right away, which is the recommendation there. Yeah. But like we do that sometimes explicitly as a deterrent. Like the party, like 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 the, one of the big things I talk about here. I don't want to get too long on this. Is you want to use the fact that some players are knowledgeable as a design tool. Like you want your veterans to see a barb devil when they're like level three and go, mm, I don't know, guys. We might want to chill the hell out before we talk to this guy. Like that's not a problem. Like characters in world might know that devils are dangerous and should be approached with caution. And you can build that into your uh, into your design by telegraphing these things. Yeah. 
But yeah, the, when you're first starting out, that is a really good guideline. Don't throw like a CR 13 thing at a CR 7 party. But Wizards of the Coast does it. They do that in Chapter 3 of Avernus. They have a oh, then, Narzagon. What's it called? A Narzagon? Uh, it's the thing that writes the nightmares? Yeah. Yeah, Narzagon. Mm-hmm. They like, send one after a level seven party. The yeah, the I mean, then you have what's Avriector in a uh, rhyme of the Frost Maiden. I mean, it's ancient white dragon, like against a fourth level party. Come on, <laughs> and it's like, and and white <laughs> dragons are basically just like big dogs. You know, they're like, mm, who's in my house? You know, so it's not like you can like kind of like chill out. And like, oh well, she's blind. Yeah. Yeah, with 60 feet of blind vision. Blind sight. <laughs> yeah, Eric, but I mean, like, that... Eric, that's a good question about, like, how do you use high CR creatures against uh, lower parties? The, that dragon is not programmed to stay and fight the party to the death. As soon as it hits an HP threshold, that dragon is programmed to run away. Yeah. So if the party sneaks up on it and does a bunch of dragon to... This is about the the dragon of Lost Mind of Fendel. Yeah. That's in Thunder Tree. Mm-hmm. The druid just asks you to chase it off. You can accomplish that by just doing some damage to the dragon carefully. And it's like, oh man, this place sucks. I'm out. Yeah, like dragons live a long time. So they and you really need to telegraph it too, like how deadly something like that can be for a low level party. Because um, while it's possible, I mean, it's, you're what like level three or four when you get to that Thunder Tree. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. You can take it. I think you're CR nine, but like you shouldn't, <laughs> and that's the point of that adventure. <laughs> like you, like the druid's like, "Hey, could you help me get into this?" You'd be like, "No." <laughs> the reason the druid's asking you is the druid doesn't want to beef with that dragon; would rather use you all as a proxy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I always felt like that that encounter was meant just to like teach players like what they should and shouldn't fight. And that's definitely... But it's also something you can return to. Like, a level 5 party could very... After you complete, like, Lost Mind of End, After you finish dealing with Wave Echo Cave, a level 5 party could very easily scare off a young green dragon at that point, because they're potent enough. So. I think it's a good design, too, because we very very rarely in 5e do we return to old locations, and I get a little bit bummed about that in the, in the sandbox design. Yeah, I mean, the problem with this edition is that it's creating a lot of like content in a vacuum and in previous editions they would give you like big lore books so you can continue to build out your sandbox and you know it was more it it gave you more tools for creating your own stuff it was in other words like teaching you how to fish versus you know catching you a bunch of fish and be like here eat for 12 months um i i missed that about the second edition but i understand like in terms of like I mean, to, to be a DM in second edition, like that was like your part-time job, <laughs> which you didn't get paid for except for in snacks. So you had to do like a lot of work. And I would argue that was probably in third edition as well. Um, it wasn't. I was so- thinking about this too. Cause like in like the first star Wars movie that aired for the people who are going to start correcting me. Yeah. Like they mentioned the clone wars and that, and that's just an interesting world detail. Like, Oh, this world has history. We do that in Omeria a lot. We talk about the attack of regrets, and people are always like, "What's the attack of regrets?" And I'm like, "It's just a plot device." Nobody you know, let it go. Yeah, nobody likes <laughs> nobody likes my answer when I get into it. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, um, I, I do miss I do miss that about second edition. Like, if you want to really get into Forgotten Realms, you can take a deep dive into some of those second edition books, which can tell you everything you want to know <laughs> about the littlest things. And give you, they just, they don't even give you adventures. They could just give you like plot hooks that you can build out yourself. I think if you're going to kill players, you should do it before level three because yep. it's easier to hand wave and reset and go. And then the whole party was eaten alive by oozes. So we'll start you back in that door. Now, knowing that there are oozes there now. What would you want to do? Yeah. Like, it's harder to do that at level five plus. Like, I take off training wheels after level three and five, especially. But yeah. At level one and two, I'll be more forgiving. It's also harder to kill people. Like, I think it's okay to kill people at low levels, too, because it establishes, like, you are willing to kill them. Because if you if you early on show, like, oh, let me coddle you, like, they're going to be a lot more reckless throughout the game. And then somebody losing a first level character 
is not going to be nearly as upset about somebody losing like a seventh level character who's going to be just one of my straight players. His space luchador, space luchador died level eight last week. Now they're going to have to go on a quest to get Ray's dead done, and he's really bummed about it. But I'm like, I told you, they told you to back up, and then you got your ass beat. Oh well. Yeah, like, I I don't mind especially when people are really reckless as first level players. Cause I mean, they're like essentially made out of eggshells and it's like, like, dude, what are you doing? Rushing in at four, There's four, two four. Rick Sarge. Yeah. Yeah. I'm running. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, it's like some wolves attack. I'm going to rush up and hit him. Like, okay. You're about to learn what pack tactics is, but more power to you. <laughs> My, what you can do is a plot device, though. Like, if your party accidentally oopses themselves into a situation, I do like the strategy of freezing the scene before the last character is going down and then having the party roll up a secondary party that's also on a, an unrelated quest that eventually leads them there. And then you can... That's from Alex's adventure. And then... <laughs> what, the what is that? And then... And then uh, I... Sorry, I have questions. Yeah, just... <laughs> now, one of our artists just. And then you can have a you can have another party come and rescue them, and then they can team up briefly. One of our so what I'm talking about. One of our artists just finished this piece of art, and I don't know what the, I don't I'm, I don't know the context of it. And it's like this like it's a ghost captain with his acid snail pet. Oh, there's a map on the side of his shelf. Duh, <laughs> that is. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> That's so this is your company. I know. I, know, I can't quit. I'm gonna make, it's gonna be. D, I told you it's gonna be DM Laura for now. Like Laura. I think Laura's in the chat too. So, um, uh, no, she hasn't been hanging out. She's she works all week. She's like, I'm taking a break. <laughs> dude, that is. I just can't stop looking at it because <laughs> that snail's like, oh, yeah, man. Paladins, rogues, clerics, fighters all have main character built into them. Like the fighter's gonna have. A stronghold eventually. Yeah. The clerics and become a leader of their church. The paladin's on a holy quest. The rogue is dealing with some sort of personal beef. And oh shit, Laura's See? here. I told you. <laughs> I remember she made the comment earlier about um she's always I'm always here. Oh. <laughs> she 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 started the company. She's in a time loop. She's a treasure cat. I'm a, Laura, I'm gonna send you this art so you can see what we're talking about. Dude, it's 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 like top tier Matias. So weird. <laughs> mm. We've got about two oh, and a half man. minutes left, y'all. So um, I might, I, I got to go fold a bunch of clothes today. So I don't know if I can go complain about animated objects. You guys have additional questions? Ask us in the Discord. Uh, we'll be sure to answer them. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have more specific details about submitting your content for publication next week. For now, focus on making sure you can complete the process of writing whatever content you want to run. And now you are you are ready to just draft up content for your players and maybe for other potential GMs out there. Yeah, the, you have the tools. Yeah, we'll have the next one will be the big Q and A where we will uh, um, where we will. Um, answer any final questions that you have and tell you how you can come join our team. Take take my job so I can go. Uh, the How to Write Tabletop Adventures channel, Marshall. Sorry, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm moving to Cancun. No, I'm moving to, All right, moving good to luck. Vallarta. I'll see you later. I'm not moving deeper into the path of hurricanes. It ain't happening for me. I, how often does the wet, the no, 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 not Cancun. I'm talking about Puerto Vallarta. Now, granted, when I was in Puerto Vallarta, I did get hurt by, hit by a hurricane, ironically. Even being on the Pacific Coast, I'm like, I just can't get away from this shit. But <laughs> uh, anyways, yes, we love you all. You're amazing. Thank you. Um, and we will Oops. see you next week and in the chat. And um, if you want to hear me complain about animate objects, I'll probably be on to do that a little Lord. bit later. He will complain all day long about animate objects. I hate it so much. I hate it. But anyways, peace, y'all.
Have a good night, everyone. Like and subscribe. Oh, wait, wrong thing. That's the wrong thing. Smash. <laughs> Smash that subscribe button. That's the subscribe button. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>